Hello everybody. I am so excited today to get to show you a very cool piece of vintage professional television equipment. This is a Sony DFS 700 video switcher and it was made in 2000. I'm going to start uh, with a little 5 minute or 10 minute uh, training course on what a video switcher is. What is it for? Well video switchers are actually very crucial components in broadcast television both live, especially live, and recorded. First of all the core function of a video switcher is to take multiple video sources and switch between them. These are most most often cameras, they could be VTRs or a digital video player, it could be video from a computer like a Zoom meeting for example, lots of things. For example, when you're doing an interview show, a common setup is with three cameras, one on the host, one on the guest, and a wide shot of both of them. And when you tape the show, you're switching between those cameras live. And when I say live, it could be a live broadcast or live to tape, but live television and a great deal of recorded programming would be crippled or impossible to do without a switcher. But video switchers do far more than switch video, at least most of them do. They can handle graphics too. When you run a device called a character generator into your switcher, the switcher can do what's called downstream keying to display the character generator's output on the screen. This can be text or graphics or a slide. Oftentimes it's what's called a super or a lower third. That's the fancy graphic at the bottom that gives you someone's name. Many video switchers can also do upstream keying. That's when you use a technique like chroma keying or the green screen effect to key out a subject so that you can put something else behind them. And then finally, many switchers can perform what are called mix effects or MEs. That's when a digital effect is applied to one or more video sources, uh, like fancy transitions or transforming the video source in some way or applying effects like borders or drop shadows. This switcher can do all of those things and I am so excited to get to demonstrate all of it to you. Today's video is going to outline the specifications and capabilities of the unit and then I'm going to cover basic switching. I'll make at least one additional video where we explore the more advanced functions. In 2000, there were three video switchers in Sony's lineup. This DFS 700 was the smallest of the group. It is an eight input switcher, which means you can connect eight video sources to it and switch between them. It is a single ME switcher, and that means it can only perform mix effects on one source. That means, for example, that we can't do a two-box effect like you often see on the news using this switcher. But single ME switchers, even today, actually aren't uncommon. The switcher we use at the station, a Ross Carbonite Solo, is a single ME switcher. At this time, Sony was also selling the larger DVS-2000C switcher, and then at the top of the line was the HDS 7000, which was actually a high definition switcher introduced in 1998. I can't imagine how many hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not more, such a switcher cost back then. Sony still makes switchers today, but I'm not sure how popular they are. Today, the most popular video switchers by far are sold by Blackmagic Design. They're low cost, good value for the money, and really popular with amateur video producers, streamers, and a lot of small TV stations. They seem to be shooting for larger TV stations with some of their models as well, but I'm not sure how well they're penetrating that market. 
For stations like ours, there's Ross, who I've mentioned before, and New Tech, famous for the video toaster in the 1990s, sells the TriCaster. I have a TriCaster. It's awesome, and there will be a video or series about it someday. But right now, it lives at the station. And then for your large commercial TV stations and sports leagues and the Super Bowl and the like, the most popular manufacturer of video swishers is probably Grass Valley, but I wouldn't be surprised if Sony still has a foothold here too. I don't know when we actually got this switcher. It might have been just a few years ago, but we actually only retired it a couple of years ago. We used it for one show, our TV bingo, and it had one job. We used its Emmy to squeeze the host into a window. We did this because until a couple of years ago, we were still a standard definition station, and we were using standard definition studio cameras. Once we fully shifted to HD broadcasting, we were able to move the squeeze back function onto the Ross switcher. I was actually a little sad to see this switcher go because it has a catalog of wonderful effects and transitions and animations that we'll explore in this series. And we used one of those effects for the squeeze back effect in Bingo. The Ross switcher actually isn't capable of generating a similar effect, so we just do a simple shrink and grow. As you can see, uh, the switcher is actually in two pieces. We have the control panel, and then we have what Sony calls the processor unit, which is meant to be mounted into a rack. The two connect using uh, a long cable, and although we retired this a long time ago, it's taken me until now to actually start playing with this thing because when we took it out of service and removed it from the rack and everything, we lost the cable. Um, and so we didn't know where it was. It must be in storage somewhere, but we don't know where. So I wasn't sure that we'll see the connections and it's actually a standard connection. It's a female DB25 connector on here and on here. And so I kind of wondered if a standard DB25 male to male cable would work. Good guy Sony in the service manual gives you the pinout uh, of both of these, and it's literally just pin 1 to pin 1, pin 2 to pin 2, etc. And so on DigiKey, I found a male to male DB25 cable that goes pin 1 to 1, 2 to 2, etc. It was $16, I bought it, and it worked! So this thing is now running again after a couple of years, which is super exciting. So let's start by taking a look at the inputs and outputs of the unit. Here's the back of the processor unit. I've shut everything down and pulled all the, or most of the connections out so you can see better. So as you can see, there's a lot of video connections on here, but about a third of them actually aren't functional. And uh, I'll explain why in a bit. So the first thing you see here is that everything's grouped by digital and analog I.O. And then inside those, they are grouped again by outputs and inputs. So what have we got here? I'll start out at the far left. The first thing we have are two SDI program outputs. SDI, um, I've mentioned it before, but if you don't know, uh, it is a broadcast standard digital uh, video signal format. SDI carries digital video, and today that can be up to like 8K video over a standard BNC coax cable. And SDI was very nice because when it started becoming standard, uh, in the late, near the end of the 90s, I think, um, it was nice because everyone's existing wiring that they might have used for composite or component video, 
they could just reuse that wiring. They didn't have to run all new coax cable and they could keep that for decades even. And when they went high definition, they could still use the same, same old cabling infrastructure. So that was very nice. So we've got two SDI program outputs. What is a program output? Your program output is the main output of the switcher. It is what's going to your transmitter or to your VTR if you're recording a program. That is your main output. And you get two of them here. Below that we have what's called a clean out. A clean out is similar to your program out except it doesn't include things like downstream keys. It is a quote unquote clean output of whatever video source is currently selected on the program bus, which is the bus of the switcher that selects what comes out of the program output. Now on this switcher, the clean out is actually configurable. By default, it's a clean out. Uh, you can also set it to be a preview out. A preview out is uh, pretty much the second most important output that you'll be looking at on a switcher. When you're a video uh, switcher operator, when you're a technical director, uh, You'll be looking at many monitors, but your two most important monitors, and that's why I have two of them here, is you'll usually have your program out on the right and your preview out on the left. Your program out is so you can see what's actually on TV right now, but your preview out, uh, the best way to describe it is it's what's going to next be on the program output. So if you're switching between multiple sources, you might have the source that's going to be next on your preview bus. And then when you perform your transition, whatever's on the preview bus is going to go out to your program bus and be on TV. So that's what a preview outputs for. And that's what I have this clean out connector configured to be. After that, we have eight SDI inputs, except actually uh, on this switcher, we actually only have four. We have four SDI inputs. So these are uh, SDI 5 to 8 are actually not functional on this machine. This switcher, like most video switchers, uh, you could order them with certain configurations. This switcher has been configured in the base configuration. It has no options installed. The base configuration is four SDI inputs and four component inputs. Sony would sell you option cards that you could install in the machine. You remove the front of the panel and then slot the cards in, pretty big cards. Sony would sell you optional cards uh, to give you composite video inputs, S-video inputs, uh, an extra uh, ME, so this could be a 2ME switcher if you bought that upgrade. Uh, and there was an optional card uh, to add 3D effects. None of those options are installed in this switcher. Uh, it is in its base configuration. So we have four SDI inputs, four component inputs, and nothing else. So we'll continue. We have a bunch of other options for program outs. We actually have three, or excuse me, two composite program outs. And we have a dedicated composite preview out. We have two component program outputs. And we have two S-video program outputs. So we do have a full complement of analog and digital program outputs and that's nice because at a TV station you might have needed multiple program outputs. Uh, you may have run a composite program out into your transmitter uh, or into the RF modulator that prepares the signal for your transmitter. You might run another composite uh, a program output into uh, the cable head end uh, modulator for the cable system that was carrying your channel. 
Uh, you might run an SDI program out into your uh, digital Betacam VTR if you were lucky enough to have one of those. Uh, or if you had a Betacam SV SP VTR, you might use the component program uh, output and run into that. So uh, all of these outputs are standard. Sony wanted to make sure you could get your video out to whatever format you needed. Down below here we have three black burst outputs. What on earth is a black burst? Well, uh, in physical terms, black burst is just a black composite video signal. That's it. It's a black composite video signal. Now, why on earth do you get three black composite video signals? Why would you need three dedicated outputs for that? Well, this switcher, like most video switchers, requires every input video device to be genlocked to it. What is Genlock? Well, uh, you might know if you've watched YouTube channels that explain things better than mine, you might have seen a video about how television works. And if you have, you'll know that uh, television, at least uh, old school interlaced television, the picture is drawn a line at a time, right? Well, let's say you have a video switcher and you have a bunch of different video sources hooked up to it. Those video sources may not all be drawing their pictures all at the same time, and that's a problem. Except for the few number of switchers that have digital frame buffers and stuff so that they can time shift inputs and line everything up, most switchers need everything to be genlocked. And what that means is you run one of these black burst signals to your video equipment. Your cameras, this uh, Panasonic convertible camera, has a Genlock input on it. This Canopus ADVC 1000 DV to SDI converter, it has a Genlock input on it. A Genlock connector, uh, connection uh, may be called Genlock, or, or oftentimes it may be called Ref for reference. Everything has to be Genlocked. So the switcher generates a genlock signal that you can run into all of your video sources so that they all draw their pictures in time with each other which is necessary for the switcher to be able to do its job. Your video sources uh, use that blackburst signal to synchronize the video signals that they are generating to it and then everybody's drawing their images at the exact same time, in time with each other. Uh, <laughs> when you're a hobbyist like me, it's kind of sucky that a anything you use with this thing has to be genlocked, but uh, it's just a reality with uh, video switchers. Sony gave you three of them. The reason there's only three is because most things that have genlock inputs also have loop outputs. Uh, this uh, converter does. So you loop Genlock into it. It has a Genlock out that you can loop back out into your next device. So you can cover all eight inputs uh, with these three most of the time. So we move on to our analog video inputs. And like I mentioned, because this switcher is in its base configuration with no options installed, you get four component inputs and nothing else. No composite inputs, no S-video inputs. Does that suck? Yeah, it sucks. Um, it's not a total showstopper though. I have enough stuff here that's either SDI or component to fully demonstrate this switcher. And if I have something that's composite or S-video that I want to run into it, I can use something like this Blackmagic Design Analog to SDI Mini Converter. You can put in composite, uh, or S-Video or Component, and it spits out SDI. Now, when you're using something like this, the Genlock issue becomes a thing because, if you notice, there's no Genlock input on this. So, technically, I can't use this converter with this switcher because it can't accept a Genlock. I can't synchronize it to it. But there's a little bit of a cheat that you can do. Um, I'll explain that in just a moment. Uh, I'll explain that very shortly, in fact, because the next thing we're looking at 
These are reference video inputs. So these are Genlock inputs. Well, if the switcher is able to generate its own black burst signal, and this is the video switcher, this is the source of all Genlocking, why do you need Genlock inputs? Well, um, some stations just may be big enough that Genlock needs to be run, you know, to other places in the building, and perhaps an entire building needs to be synchronized. You could have cameras, uh, who knows how many uh, dozens or hundreds of feet away um, that you need to connect back to your switcher, and it all has to be synchronized. So some large stations may actually have a house genlock generator. Uh, it is a rack mount device. We actually have one, although we don't use it anymore. We don't need it. It's a big rack mount device that does one job, which is generating genlock, and it just has a ton of genlock outputs, and you can run genlock to everything you need. So this thing generates its own uh, black burst signal if you just want to sy synchronize everything right to the switcher. But if you have some other genlock generator that's already connected to other stuff uh, and you want this thing to be synchronized to that, well, this thing has reference video inputs. You run your genlock into that and then this switcher is genlocked to that external signal. And these black burst outputs also become genlocked to that external signal and then uh, everything is happy. So I was talking about how something like this black magic converter doesn't have a genlock input which sucks but there's a little bit of a cheat that you can do and I've actually done this cheat successfully well kind of successfully there are some implications to it. Uh, I have used this to run a composite camera into the switcher. Plug in your composite video, you get SDI out, run it into one of the SDI inputs, and you're gold. But how do you genlock it? If it's not genlocked, it's not going to display correctly on the switcher, and it's going to mess up the switcher. Well, here's what you do. You take your composite camera, and you run the composite video input. Remember how I said black burst is just a black composite video signal? Well, you can take almost any composite video signal and use it as a genlock source. So I take my composite camera or VCR or whatever, and I actually run the video input into the switcher's reference video input. And then I loop it back into this converter. And that works. And then the whole switcher becomes referenced by your rogue, non-synchronizable uh, composite video source. It doesn't work perfect. There are some issues I've found that come up with it. But uh, in a pinch, that can make it possible to use one video source that's uh, otherwise not genlockable. That's the only thing that sucks about needing to genlock stuff, is it limits you to professional equipment like this camera and this DV converter. And I'm lucky enough to have some uh, professional equipment, but it does limit me nonetheless, but that's okay. For the purposes of me showing this to you guys, I do have enough equipment, enough SDI and uh, component equipment that can be genlocked to, uh, to demonstrate everything. So we get four component inputs. The other four are not functional. The four S-Video inputs are not functional. And then we have a DSK key in. What is a DSK key? Well, DSK stands for Downstream Keyer. Earlier, I talked about how many switchers have a downstream keyer. This switcher is no different. There are many ways to perform downstream keying. One way is called luminance keying. That's when portions of the signal to be keyed are removed based on the luminance values of the signal. Another way is chroma keying, where portions of a specific color are removed. Yet another way is masking, where a mask is drawn around the content to be kept or sometimes the content to be removed. These methods are all useful based on the design of the graphic to be keyed, and this switcher can do all of them. But the most complex and oftentimes useful method 
of downstream keying is called key and fill. In this method, two video signals are sent to the switcher. The fill signal, which is the graphic itself, and the key signal, which is a black and white signal representing which parts of the fill signal should be keyed out, shown in black, and which parts should stay, shown in white. The key signal can also contain grayscale, which will result in partial transparency in those areas. This style of keying is necessary for complex graphics, especially those that have partial transparencies and is employed by most modern character generators. This switcher can do this too. Run your fill signal into the video input of your choice and run the key signal into the DSK key in. Next we have our uh, panel connector. This is a DB25 uh, female connector and uh, the control panel also has a female DB25 connector. And uh, we just use a DB25 male-to-male -male cable with one-to-one -one, uh, pinout to connect the two. And uh, like I said earlier, I can now confirm that a $16, uh, probably computer-grade cable works perfectly. And then down here, we have a tally connector. And that is a connector... All the different pins are going to run to all the different tally lights uh, that you have in your studio or in your control room. Your monitors will have tally lights. That's what these are right here. And your cameras are probably going to have red tally lights on top of them. And all that does is when, you're, when a particular input is coming out the program output, its corresponding tally light is going to uh, be active. It's gonna, it's probably a logic high signal, like a five volt, uh, signal probably. And, uh, all those tally signals are gonna run to your monitors in the control room, and they're gonna run to your cameras out in the studio. So, when you switch to camera two, the red light on top of camera two lights up so that the people in the studio know that that's the camera that's live. And, uh, Usually, in addition to your program and preview monitors, you'll have a bunch of smaller monitors that show all of your possible video inputs, and whichever monitor is currently live, the little tally light for that will light up. So that's what your tally connector is for. You have an editor connector. This is basically a serial port, uh, and it's meant to connect to an edit controller. Uh, I have an edit controller. I don't think I can interface it with this switcher, but I can use it with the switcher. Uh, and someday I will do a demonstration of that edit controller and we'll edit a YouTube video using AB roll editing. That would be pretty cool. But you have an edit connector. Sony sold a couple of different compatible uh, edit controllers. And uh, that basically talks to the switcher to tell it to automatically switch to certain inputs and when to switch and stuff like that. You get a USB-B port labeled terminal. That is used for one function, which is to upgrade the software uh, of the unit. The processor unit has its own software and the control panel has its own software. Uh, from what I can tell, both of these are on the launch version 1.0 software. Sony did upgrade it over time, but of course that's been long lost to time. And even if it wasn't lost to time, I wouldn't uh, upgrade it anyway because I'd be scared of something going wrong. And it's working just fine as is anyway. And then finally we have two GPI inputs. GPI is general purpose input. Uh, it is basically, these connectors basically just accept a logic signal from something like uh, an edit controller. I would use these with the edit controller that I have here. And basically, uh, it's just a coax cable, you can see. And when the signal goes high, uh, or, or when it goes high and then low, however it works, uh, it tells the switcher to cut. That's all it does. That's all it's for. When it goes high, the switcher cuts. Um, so that's what these are for. And thanks to having these, this thing's compatible with just about any type of, of uh, edit controller. And then we have an IEC power connector. 
and uh, that's all your inputs and outputs. So yeah, four SDI inputs, four component inputs, a wide array of outputs, which is nice, and uh, a choice of composite or SDI uh, preview outputs. And you've got your Genlock outputs, your Genlock inputs, downstream key or key input. Uh, so uh, really everything you need on just on almost any type of video switcher. Very nice. All right, so here's our wiring for today. The first SDI program output is going to this uh, Sony PVM9L2 professional video monitor for me. And then the second SDI program output is going into this Sony DSR-70A portable DV cam VTR. Uh, don't worry about this guy. There will be a video on it someday. I promise. But uh, uh, his job today is just to record the uh, program feed for you guys. Uh, my first input, my camera one, is this Panasonic... What's this called? An AWE800A uh, convertible camera, SDI feed. And the second SDI feed is uh, my DV cam camcorder, which is sitting up there. And uh, that's being converted from DV to SDI by this Canopus ADVC1000 converter. The composite preview output is going to my Sony PVM8045Q uh, professional video monitor. And uh, that's being looped into my Sony CCD TRV66 Hi8XR camcorder. So this guy is recording the preview feed for you guys. And I guess the last thing is uh, the black burst out is going into the uh, Canopus and then I'm looping it from the Canopus into the Panasonic camera. All right, welcome to the control panel of the Sony DFS 700 video switcher. And uh, welcome to a very, very noisy room right now. I hope you can hear me okay. There's half a dozen things in here, all of them with quite noisy cooling fans. So uh, hopefully the sound pans out. So the first thing you notice on this or any switcher is there's a lot of buttons and knobs. There's even a great big throttle lever type thing. There's a lot of lights going on. But uh, in today's video, we're just going to cover basic switching. And uh, uh, then we'll cover more advanced stuff in a later video. So here's the thing. Every switcher is going to have a certain number of things that are common across all of them. But the two most important things are your program bus, which is this row of buttons here, and your preview bus, which is this row of buttons here. And uh, uh, the thing to know is that whatever is on the program bus is what's going to be on TV when it comes up. And whatever you select on the preview bus is going to show up on your preview monitor and it's what's going to be on the program bus next when you execute a cut or a transition or anything. So you can see I've got two cameras uh, hooked up here. The camera on input one, which on this switcher years, maybe decades ago, was labeled VTR1. Um, and then uh, the second input, which was labeled VTR2 on this, is a second camera I've got sitting on a shelf. So, program bus, preview bus. Now on this particular switcher, they're, also, they're, they're labeled background and foreground. And the reason for that is because Sony considered this switcher a very uh, effects heavy switcher. It's got a rich catalog of effects. And in Sony's opinion, you might have bought this not to do general switching, but you might have bought this purely for the effects it can execute, and you might have used this in conjunction with another switcher, which, ironically enough, is literally how we used this switcher back at the station. So, 
They're labeled background and foreground because when you're doing a special effect, anything in the foreground will be on this bus and whatever's in the background, usually a uh, color mat like we have here, that'll be on your, your background bus. But for our purposes, program on the upper bus, preview on the lower bus. The next most important buttons you're going to have uh, is the cut button and that cuts whatever's on the preview bus to the program bus and it puts whatever was on the program bus back on the preview bus. So if I hit cut here you can see we have just cut to camera 2 and uh, camera 1 is now on the uh, preview bus. I hit cut again camera uh, 1 is back on the program bus, camera 2 is on the preview bus. 90% of the time when you're working in a TV station using a video switcher, you'll be doing one of two things. You'll either be cutting, uh, you might select something on the preview bus that you want to cut to next and then hit cut. Like that. Or you might directly address your cameras directly on the program bus. Um, Cathode Ray Dude on YouTube has a wonderful video also about video switchers, formatted a bit differently than this video is, so you might want to watch his as well. Um, something I learned from his video that I didn't actually know, it's certainly never been talked about at where I work, is that apparently in some circles directly poking the program bus like this is frowned upon. I don't know why it would be. Um, and it has a name which is hot punching. I Nothing I ever heard of. Um, but a lot of the time that's exactly what you're going to be doing. When I'm taping one of our sit-down interview shows with three cameras, I have our wide shot on the preview monitor and then I'm just hot punching everything on the program bus. And the reason for that is because modern switchers give you what's called a multi-view output. Uh, I showed it to you earlier uh, in this video, but here it is again. This is the multi-view of our Ross Carbonite Solo switcher. Uh, and it's literally just an SDI or HDMI output that you can put into a monitor and the switcher generates the program monitor, the preview monitor, and monitors of all your inputs, or at least the first eight inputs usually, all on that one monitor, which is very nice. Modern switchers do that. Old school switchers like this one do not have a multi-view output, which is why I actually have separate uh, uh, PVMs uh, going here. So yeah, I can already see all my cameras and I just keep a wide shot on the uh, preview just so I can see everything that's going on. And uh, I'm just hot punching between the three cameras. That's totally fine. Uh, stuff like bingo, uh, you'll be doing cuts. Or we have a portable Sony switcher. It's a Sony model MCS-8M. Uh, it's about 10, 10, 11, 12 years old uh, 1080i portable switcher. I use that switcher when I go to councils. Um, so I carry this switcher and, and all the other equipment to council. Actually, it's just one council that I have to uh, do this for. And there's only two cameras in that council. So I'll literally put one camera on program, one camera on preview, and for two hours, I'm just hitting cut. And that's all you have to do. <laughs> um, so yeah, most common things you'll be doing cutting or directly addressing the program bus. Your next important button is uh, this button labeled Auto Trans uh, on this switcher. On other switchers it may be just called Auto. Um, but this executes an effect. Now uh, I need to push this button. Uh, so by default on any switcher your Auto Trans is going to do a dissolve. And there we go, we've done a dissolve. Once the dissolve is completed, uh, then it, the preview monitor switches to whatever was last on. I'll do this. And, oops. Uh, we were here, and I want to go to camera one next. And we're back on 
camera one. So yeah, your auto trans. Your auto trans can execute anything. By default, it's usually a dissolve. Sometimes you'll use dissolves. Uh, when I do council, I'll usually dissolve from a wide shot to the shot of the mayor when the council begins. And when council ends, I'll dissolve from the shot of the mayor back to the wide shot. And that's how I begin and end council. So sometimes you'll do dissolves. And then I guess apparently what interests people most about all of these is uh, this thing right here. Uh, sometimes I apparently some people call it a T-bar, others just call it a lever. Um, but it is a lever, and and its purpose is to simply. Nope. Oh, there we go. So when you turn this thing on, you have to sort of. It has to learn where the extremes of the. Uh, of the lever R, so that's why it didn't work at first. But you can see, I move the lever and it executes a dissolve. And I can dissolve just as quickly, or just as slowly, as you want. And despite how big and important it looks, you'll almost never use this. I can count on one hand the number of times that I've used this in my three and a half year television career. Um, there's just so few, there's two things that come to my mind that I've ever used this for. One is for when we were doing an interview show where the guy read an excerpt from his book. And so it was 20 minutes of a guy reading from, from his book. And so while he did that, I would slowly dissolve every five minutes or so. Uh, I would slowly dissolve from a shot of him to the white shot. And I did that just so you weren't jarring the viewer who might be uh, engrossed in listening to him reading his book by doing a hard cut. I would just do a slow dissolve. The other time I've used this is we, we once had a musician in the studio and uh, we had I think three cameras on this musician um, and while this musician was singing his song uh, my cameraman would sort of line up his face on the side of the screen and on the other camera was a wide shot of him and uh, I would pull back and hold him between the cameras and you 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 all have seen that effect where someone's singing and, and it's really nice and beautiful and and you get this hold between two cameras where you see like the side of their side of their face like this in a close-up and then their whole body in a in a wide shot and that's how you do it just like that so that's all the basic stuff. That's what you're going to be using on a switcher 90% of, of uh, the time. Uh, right here, this LED display, it says trans rate. Uh, for me, it's about seven years now. Um, but in this context, uh, you can set how many frames uh, an effect takes place. So 30 frames is uh, one second. Um, I can change that by hitting set and then punching in a number on the number pad over here. Let's go 60 and hit enter. And you can see it emits a little beep. And now when I hit auto trans, we get a very slow two second dissolve. Maybe I want a quick dissolve. I can do that. Maybe I want a really quick dissolve which might be good for supers. Or maybe I want a very slow dissolve. There it goes. <laughs> and you can see the little LED meter slowly progressing. And I can just stop it like that. Uh, I think the last thing I'll show you in today's video is that of course, I've been teasing you, this switcher has wonderful, wonderful effects that it, it can execute. It, it's really, Sony just really went hog wild with all the effects. And none of them are really, well, very few of them are sketchy. I, I mean, it's all very genuine stuff that you may use in one television program or another. So, to do effects, first of all, these two buttons over here, you saw me poke earlier, 
This one's called mix, and it's lit up. That means dissolve. So when mix is lit up, mix means dissolve. Sometimes people call a dissolve a mix. You're mixing two video sources, and that makes sense. Um, sometimes people call it a fade. Uh, where I work, the vernacular is dissolve, so that's, that's the term I've always used. But if we don't want to do a dissolve, if we want to do one of the fancy uh, uh, effects that this thing can generate, you have to put it into effect mode. So that's what we've done. And uh, one effect is already lit up, and it's got a little picture of a globe on it. What, what could that be? Well, let's find out. <laughs> there you go. A little bouncing ball. And uh, all the same rules apply. I can, uh, whoops. I can set the transition rate. <laughs> or I can use the uh, lever and execute it at any speed I want or even stop it in the middle. Right? It's cool. Uh, let's choose another effect. Um, so when you, when you directly choose one of the effects uh, listed in these 10 keys, you need to hit the direct pattern button, make sure that's lit up. And uh, let's choose this effect. There you go. Cool, right? And the, the, actually, this, this particular effect is pretty cool. If I use the lever and I stop part way, it doesn't stop animating. See, it's just constantly animating at whatever, uh, uh, whatever progression you left it at. I can get really, I can make a really gentle wave like that. Cool, right? It doesn't just stop animating, they actually thought of that. Very cool. Um, we've got a classic, uh, flip. We've got a page turn. I like the page turn. There's another one. Got a slide. Cool slide. And I'm going to use the slide as an example here. There's these two buttons right here, NR and reverse. So just as an example, I'm going to turn both of them off. And when I do a transition, the slide comes in. And if I do it again, the slide always comes in. The new source always slides over top of the old source. See? But if I hit NR, it means normal in reverse, so that slide is now coming in and out. But you'll also notice that uh, the same source is being used because of this. But there's a way of modifying how sources work using these keys. Um, if I go back to this one, you'll notice that the rippling is only occurring on camera two. If I do this, now the ripple's on camera one. And if I do this, camera two ripples, camera one ripples, camera two ripples, camera one ripples. So it's all based on what you want how you want that transition to work. See? If I do that, now it's spinning in the other direction. If I do this, now it's spinning in both directions. So lots of things that you can do. Uh, you've seen it already, but I'll tell you that, uh, as you can see, the switcher has its own, what's called a color mat generator. A color mat is just a screen of solid color, or in the case of this lovely switcher, it has many patterns that you can choose and set the color. So you can see I've got kind of this denim uh, uh, pattern, which I'm kind of a fan of. Um, and if I go and press this button here, which says matte, you can see on the vacuum fluorescent display here, hopefully you can see it, it gives us many uh, uh, options. I can select the color using luminance, saturation, and hue values. So if I just turn these knobs, 
and the saturation. Make it really saturated. And the hue. Cool, right? Very easy to dial in exactly the color you want. And if I press the page button to go to the next page of, of uh, settings, we can choose the pattern. And there's 80 patterns to choose from. You can get a solid color. I'm a big fan of this 80 style brick. Checkerboard. Got kind of a plaid pattern, a couple of them. It's cool, right? I love this. This one's kind of funky, all sorts of colors. This one's cool, this uh, kind of blurred uh, pattern. I could see this being used widely in television. These are kind of cool, This, I think this is stucco. The wood planks I'm, I'm kind of a fan of. This one's pretty cool, kind of a marble pattern. And, and so just as an example here, if I go to the wood planks, hit page again, change the, cue, the hue, if I can get brown out of it, see if I can get brown. There you got kind of brown, brown wood. There you go. Uh, what else have we got? Very nice plaid. Just lots of patterns and kind of textures. Very cool. Very, very cool. Very nice function on this unit. So that's the internal video setting all the way at the end of the uh, bus. There's also a memory function. So let's bring me back up. And uh, 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 you have to tell it wh what the memory is going to be assigned to. So we'll talk about this more in the next video. But uh, this row of buttons up here uh, are called delegation buttons. And you use these buttons to choose what source is going to be assigned to what function. Um, so for example, CCR is the color corrector. This, this uh, thing actually has a color correcting function, so you can fix like, like the white balance and stuff. That's actually, this is actually the first time I've ever heard of a video switcher that can do that. So if I hit CCR, and I'll do it on camera one, um, uh, and we hit the CCR configuration button here, I can, I can do color correction saturation so I could fix the uh, woo, that's a fun that's a fun effect look at that lots of ways you can get really fun effects on this thing lots of things you can do to being able to color correct a source pretty cool I'll just uh, oh I can't assign that to black uh, that's okay I think I've got it set uh, I'll actually I'll, I can reset all the settings by holding down initial and page and that resets all the settings on that page um, so the other things we have access to is uh, memory so right that's what I was getting to so if I hit the memory delegation button I want the memory to be active on camera one and now if I hit freeze that should have frozen me and if I go to memory there I am, my, my beautiful face that I, that I uh, froze on. <laughs> there it is, and if I hit freeze again, we're back. And uh, uh, if I do that and freeze, there you go. <laughs> and uh, this button that says frame, you can tell the switcher whether you want to freeze a field because of course two fields for every frame in interlaced video you can freeze a field or you can freeze a frame frame gives you better visual quality but if you're freezing something like a character generator output you might need to freeze just a field so you don't get a jittering effect but if I turn frame on and then freeze uh, there we get two fields we get a full frame 
uh, frozen, so a, a better quality, higher resolution uh, freeze. And then finally, uh, we have black, which is exactly what it says it is. It's just a uh, black signal. And uh, this is actually generated by the black burst generator. So the same signal uh, that's uh, providing GenLock to uh, my two cameras here, that's the same signal you're looking at on the uh, program monitor when you hit the black button. Well everyone, that's all there is to show today of the Sony DFS 700 video switcher from 2000. What can I say? I love this thing. It has been so fun and very rewarding to learn this system inside and out. And I can't wait to show you more. Today, I've only shown you uh, the basic uh, features that this thing has. I've only shown you a portion of its capabilities. There's a lot more to show, and I'm looking forward to showing you that in the next installment of this series. We'll talk about the more advanced effects, we'll talk about making your own effects probably, and we'll talk about keying, we'll wire up a makeshift character generator and demonstrate uh, uh, the keying uh, functions, and uh, it should just be, it should be really cool. This thing is so fun. It was very much of its time in terms of the effects that it could create. It had some really nice digital effects uh, at the time, but it's also really fun in that you can do things that are very much before the switcher's time. You can get some really cool uh, retro television style, you know, like 80s when the first digital uh, effects started being available to TV stations. You can replicate some of those with this and uh, it's really, really fun to do. So I, I can't wait to show it all to you. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed. Please tell me what you thought of this video. I put a little more planning into this than I usually do. All my videos I'm usually flying by the seat of my pants. This is the first, uh, no, this is the second video I've ever made where I actually scripted it, or at least I scripted uh, part of this video. And uh, I procured some equipment so that I could set up proper camera angles and set up recordings to give you direct feeds of the program and preview. And, and I've got some auxiliary lighting going on right now for the FaceTime. And, and uh, I, I tried a little harder than I normally do just because I really wanted to uh, make this video as pleasant to watch and as digestible as possible. Uh, so please let me know if you liked it. Uh, but until then, until next time, thank you everyone for watching and uh, I'll see you in the next video.